Luke 9, 57. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Holy God and Heavenly Father, we ask now thy blessing upon the preaching of thy word, that it shall not return unto thee void, but accomplish its purpose. We pray in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. There is no name under all of heaven more quoted on the lips of men than the name Christ Jesus. I will guarantee that it's usually used in oath or blasphemy, and yet it's still coined upon the lips of men. Even Madeline Murray O'Hara, who says there is no God, must date her birth after the birth of Jesus Christ. I say that the word Christ is used more than any other, and yet the person of Jesus Christ is the most lonely, forgotten, forsaken that has ever walked this earth. Oh, we'll come in and uh, have revivals like this, and this has been a good attending revival. And some of you people haven't missed a night in this revival meeting. We'll take out a whole week. Now, some churches can't do that anymore. We'll take out a whole week and sit here under a message of Jesus Christ. We'll even do better than that. We'll go on encampment sometimes two, three weeks. Churches will do this and just have a great old-time camp meeting. And we'll listen concerning the name of Jesus Christ. But ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to our deportment, when it comes to our fellowship, many of us leave Christ behind, alone, and forgotten and forsaken, the lonely Jesus. The scene of our text isn't any different, I don't think, in the life of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Here Christ has preached the Sermon on the Mount, that he's gone over and fed 5,000 people. Out of 5,000 people, one follows him. That isn't bad. He comes running after him and he says to Jesus, Jesus, I don't know about those disciples around you, but say, you can count on me. I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus perceived in his heart what caused the man to say that. He had a full belly and he saw that Jesus fed well. And he turns and he tests the man. He says, see that bird? That bird is flitting back to its nest. Even birds of the air have nests. Watch the fox as it slinks to its lair. Even foxes have hoes. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. If you follow me, I can't promise you a roof over your head, only the canopy of the sky. If you follow me, I can't promise you a mansion on this earth, only one by and by. But I can't follow you this, fella. I can promise you, if you follow me, you'll be persecuted. Men will hate you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake, for they hated me before they hated you. If you follow me, take up a cross and follow me. The man did as so many did to Jesus. He turned and went away, leaving Christ alone, forgotten, forsaken, the lonely Jesus. No one ever had a more lonely birth than Jesus Christ. Can you imagine, you women, some of you absolutely go out of your minds when your time comes because you've got to get all the way down to the car and that car has to get all the way two miles away to the hospital. Can you imagine what Mary went through? Mary rode on the back of a beast of burden 82 miles to get to Bethlehem. 82 miles with the sand blasting in her face and Joseph covering that face with his cloak. 82 miles of toil and torture. And they come to Bethlehem and it's late and Joseph goes to the inn. <laughs> Sir, awaken please. The innkeeper's shutter opens. A lamp flickers. A stockinged head looks out. Children crowd around his arms. He said, I'm sorry, uh, a fellow, we're closed. I know, sir, I know you're closed, and I have no reservation. But, sir, my wife is travailing in pain. It's the firstborn. Sir, I see your children about you tonight. You must remember the firstborn. Aye. Yeah, you never forget the firstborn, eh? <laughs> They're kind of precious. Yes, I, I remember, but, sir, I, I'm sorry, we're... We're all filled up. This is the time of the paying of the taxes. And, and I'm stacked in two to a room. And, and I've even got the, the, the closet rented. I, I have no room in the inn. 
What a preview to the life of Christ if you'd analyze it. We have room for almost everything, haven't we? You have room for the second car in the garage. You have room for two televisions. We have room for beautiful furniture. We have room for pleasure. We have room for business. We have room for prosperity. But America has little room for Jesus. And we see our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, have for his first home a cattle stall. For his first lullaby, the lowing of the cattle and the bleeding of the sheep. For his first bed, a pallet of straw. was his birth a lonely birth, but his welcome was a lonely welcome. When I was born, 101 fathers came to see me. That's true. Dad told me Dad was running for U.S. Senate at that time, and he was uh, in the political eye of the people in Los Angeles, and uh, when it was announced that he had a, a whopping big 10-pound uh, boy, here they came. They put me right up in front. There's 101 babies born at the time I was in that hospital. All the fathers came by and said, oh, that must be mine. Nurse said, no, it's, it's not that ugly kid. Yours is over yonder, you see. But at least I had 101 fathers come by and look at me. Jesus was not that fortunate. When Jesus was born, listen, friends, only a few came by to view him. You say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. How about the shepherds? Oh, yes, I imagine that night. As the angels cried out unto you, was born this day in the city of David a Savior. For his name shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. I imagine that the hills were dotted with dozens of campfires as the shepherds watched their sheep by night, but the Bible says only one shepherd band bothered to go, and it was only about 700 yards from where they stood. Well, you say, now, Schuller, how about the wise men? Yes, yes, the East was the center of culture and learning of that day. There were the schools of Gamaliel, the schools of Nicodemus. Others had great schools. Listen, friends, this was the very center of learning, and yet tradition tells us three. We know only a few of the wise men dared to follow the star they'd looked for for over a thousand years. So few among so many. Not only was his welcome lonely, but the reaction of that welcome was lonely. You say, what do you mean? Well, after they found out about him, you'd think certainly they'd change their minds about him. They did. As soon as they found out who he claimed to be, Herod said, let's kill him. And he set out a decree that was to bathe this earth in the richest blood she's ever seen before or since, as every male child to and under was to die. And the next scene we see in the life of Jesus is a life of flight into refuge, as Mary and Joseph scoop the child up and run him across into Egypt. 
We have here what we call the 18 silent years of Jesus Christ. But they're not completely silent. We have a portion of time until he's 12, then 18 years that are silent. During the portion of time that he is 12, Herod dies. And ladies and gentlemen, you would almost think that with Herod dead and having read the stars and looked at the prophecies fulfilled at the coming of Jesus, they would have understood this was the Christ, the promised Messiah. And you'd think that certainly Caesar would send an embassy of honor and they would draw their swords and allow him to march back in triumph. But oh no, oh no, earth was so poor that heaven had to send a messenger. And here we see an angel hovering over Joseph and saying, it's all right now to take him back. Herod is dead. We see Jesus entering in to Nazareth where Joseph had a carpenter shop. That has been a kind of a a thrill to my heart every time I think about it. Christ said, I go to prepare a place for you. He learned his trade well on this earth. He was a young carpenter. Let's look at these 18 silent years. First, let me say this. They're not silent. They tell us something about Jesus. You say, where do you find it? In the scriptures, always. Two things. Number one, he became flesh and dwelt among us. He was God in man. Emmanuel. That means that the Godhead rested in Jesus bodily. Number two, get this please, he was tempted in like manner as we are tempted yet without sin. Now that's always comforted me. Kids, do you know that Jesus was tempted to sass his mother? He was because you've been tempted to do that. You say, did he sass her? No, he was without sin. Did you know that he was tempted to cheat in school when he studied the law? You say, how do you know? Because I've been tempted. Well, did he do it? No, because he was the son of God. Did you know that he was tempted to steal? You say, really? I can hardly believe that. Why not? He was tempted in like manner as we are tempted. He was tempted in every manner that we are tempted, yet without sin. Now, I can learn a lot about Jesus from that verse. I'm going to hypothetically, now that's with the mind of the imagination, I'm going to hypothetically act out what I think would be a day in the life of Jesus Christ. I see him, oh, 15. That's an age when kids get coordinated, especially boys. 15. He goes into the carpenter shop. And let's say that it's a Friday. And uh, he's in there working on the draw knife. Now, you must understand that back in his day, there were no lathes as we know them today. Most of the furniture was made by hand and had to be done by a craftsman. And Jesus was becoming a craftsman, a young apprentice in Joseph's carpenter shop. So he takes a vise and he puts a block of soft pine in it. And he begins to take off the corners. Now, he's learning to make arches. He just... Pulls that draw knife, pulls that draw knife, and begins to shave little shavings out of the corners. When he takes off all four corners, I see him stand up and he takes his hand knife and he's continuing those shavings, beginning to round this thing out now. He's learning the art of making arches. When suddenly he hears some kids running by outside. And he goes to the window and he looks and there's a bunch of kids from the neighborhood, his age. And they're meeting on a sandlot and one of them has a good stick and the other has a ball of twine wrapped up with some tape. They're going to play stickball. And they're starting to choose sides. And Jesus is, is shaving these, these shavings, just really not thinking. And suddenly he pricks his hand. Mm. And he looks down. And to his amazement, there on the table, that piece of wood that he was aimlessly carving is, has taken on the crude aspects of a cross. I see that lad at 15. Say, Father, not now. I'm just a boy. I haven't even entered my ministry yet. I don't want to think of a cross. I don't want to think of death. I, I want friends. That's what I want. I want companions. I want, I want kids that will run with me like that. There's no sin to this, Father. I, I'll go out and join them for a while. That, that's the best way to make friends. So I see Jesus as he comes out of that carpenter shop. There's a kid saying, who can play left field? Who can play left field? Anybody play left field? And I see Jesus in my mind's eye say, Hey, kid, can I play left field? I, I, I've never played stickball before, but, but I'm fast. I can drop a hammer and catch it before it hits the ground. And, and, and I know I can hit the ball because I can take nails and drive them in with a stick all day right in the wall. I got a good eye. Can, can I play left field? And I hear this kid say, Hey, Tom. Hey, Andy, come here. Is that Jesus? Yeah, that's him. Came in here about three years ago from Egypt. 
Oh, yeah, nice looking kid. I've never seen him before. See his back all the time when he's heading to school, but you never see the kid around much. Nice looking kid, isn't he? It's too bad. What do you mean? Well, my mother says his daddy's not really his daddy. There's a dirty story going on about his birth. Oh, the sins of the parents. What a shame. Mother said not to embarrass the kid because it's not his fault. But she also said not to play with him, just to ignore him, pretend he's not there. Uh, Jesus, is that your name? Yeah. Uh, Jesus, listen, uh, Tom can come out of shortstop and play way back there. He's so fast he can catch anything going over his head. We don't really need you today. Say, some other time, okay? Don't tell me this didn't happen in the life of Christ many times. It had to. I see Jesus as he goes back to that carpenter shop and he reaches out and he picks up that cross and he holds it to the light and he turns his head to see his body wrought upon a cross upon the floor. I believe when he was a lad he realized that he came to die alone, forgotten, forsaken, the lonely Jesus. Jesus boy, they made you be born in a manger, sweet little holy child, didn't know who you was, didn't know you come to save us, Lord, to take our sins away. Boy, the world treat you me, Lord, treat me me too. But that's how things is down here. We didn't know who you is. You done told us how. life, a lonely life. Ladies and gentlemen, his ministry was a lonely ministry. I'm just in the middle now of my 31st year in the ministry of evangelism. I'm telling you as a fact that I can go back to any church I have ever preached in and preach again except two churches. Those two churches, both of them were run by the pastor's wife, and I was quick to tell them so. But other than that, I can go back, as if not a minister, as one who would sit and listen. But not so Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ was here on this earth, people came to him with the same motive as a bank robber goes into a bank to get what he can out of it and then leave him alone and forsaken and forgotten the lonely Jesus. Have you ever followed his invitations? Follow them for just a moment. 
but I healed ten lepers. Where are the other nine? And he turned and went away sorrowing, having great riches. It seemed that everybody was coming to Jesus and then turning and leaving him alone, forgotten, forsaken, the lonely Jesus. You say, Shooter, hold on a minute now, hold it. How about that triumphal entry? Oh, yes. Who called it that? Was that Thompson or Schofield or somebody? Sure wasn't the Bible. Triumph? Uh, let's, let's go back. Jesus is coming from a city toward Jerusalem. The news is there is a king coming. And I've never seen a king before. And I'm anxious to see one. And so I head for the gate of the city. As I'm going toward the gate, up, I stumble. Oh, pardon me, sir. <laughs> I didn't see you, shorty. Yeah, well, uh, what? Zacchaeus, yes, sir. Well, I'm, I'm a, huh? He did. And you did what? <laughs> You're converted, all right. Yeah. Uh-uh. Yeah, oh, okay. I'll, I'll hoist you up here. Put you on the wall. That okay? You can see now? Sorry, buddy. I didn't mean to trip over you. I'm on my way to see a king. I've never seen one before. I, I can... I, I, well, I declare. Look at yonder. Hey! Hey! Nicodemus! Over here! How you doing? Good to see you here. Yeah, you heard him preach. You called him a great teacher. No one spake like he spake. Bartimaeus! My, it's good to see you. What? 2020, you say. Yeah, well, when he does it, he does it well, doesn't he? Is that? He sure is. Hey, Lazarus! Lazarus, over here! Mary, Martha, punch your brother. Yeah, how you doing, boy? Oh, you look good. What? Oh, you've gained 20 pounds since he raised you from the dead. Well, those old digestive juices are working again, aren't they? Yeah, go ahead, look them over. You don't have to have an imagination. There they are. The Bible says those whom Jesus befriended were there. The halt, the maim, the blind, the publicans and sinners, the lowly people. And they were throwing palm fronds in the way. And they were laying down their coats and crying, Hosanna. And we can hardly wait. Man, the king's coming. I'm going to get my... Hey. Hey, you on that donkey. Get out of the way, man. I... I Six white horses and a gold chariot's coming this way. I, I what? That's Jesus? That's the king? <laughs> You're kidding. That is Jesus. Jesus! Why do you ride to your kingdom on the back of the lowest beast of burden? Jesus, why are your feet dragging the palm fronds and why is your chin in your chest? Jesus, why do the tears trickle down your cheek? Haven't they told you? It's your triumphal entry. Triumph. You're not talking to a preacher on the back of that donkey. You're not even talking to a prophet on the back of that donkey. You're talking to God. You're talking to omniscience. You're talking to one that knows the end from the beginning and all in between. And you're talking to one who rides on a colt. And as he comes into Jerusalem, he hears the voices cry, Hosanna, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. And he knows within 72 hours, those voices shall join the motley crowd that cries, crucify him. We will not have him to rule over us. Triumph is tragedy. Jesus Christ goes to the upper room and there he washes the feet of his disciples. He's bathing those feet. Now I imagine, though the Bible doesn't say who the disciple was, but I imagine it was probably John, the beloved. He's starting to take the towel from about his loins and wipe the feet of John. Probably when one on the end gets up and he slips his feet into sandals I imagine it was Peter sitting by him and said, Hey, Judas, sit down, buddy. He hasn't dismissed you. Uh, tell the master I've got a little moonlighting job going. I've got to make a couple of bucks, you know, for the cause. I'll see you later. And Jesus looks up, and I can see a tear trickle down his cheeks and fall upon the washed foot of this disciple as he realizes that there goes Judas to betray me. Lonely man in his last hours. 
Jesus Christ then goes up to the Mount of Olives. Whenever I go to the Holy Land, take a tour, I always started at the Mount of Olives. It's the most picturesque spot of all the Holy Land. You overlook the entire history of Jerusalem. And I see Jesus now in his last few hours as he looks down over a city that he'd fought for and lost. And he cries out, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft would I have gathered thee as a hen doth gathereth her brood beneath her wings, but you would not have me. I think the saddest words of tongue or pen of these. He came to his own, but his own received him not. Then I see Christ as he takes the inner circle. And he says, now, Peter, James, John, you, you seem to understand me a little better than the others. Come with me to Gethsemane. I, I have a problem. I have a burden. I want you to pray for me. Say, hey, look your Bibles over pretty carefully. You'll find that's the only time Jesus ever asked anybody to pray for him. What a privilege to be in that once in a lifetime, once in the history of mankind, that God himself asked somebody to pray for him. My, what a privilege that would be. And he takes Peter, James, and John, and he sets them here, and he says, Now, I'm going to stone's throw. I, I've got a real burden. Pray for me, lest you enter into temptation. And he goes, and he throws himself upon his knees, and he prays, and he says, Oh, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. You say, What cup is he speaking of? Oh, the cup into which every drag of sin from the ages have been cast. When Cain, in jealousy over the false sacrifice that he had made in the true one of Abel, slips up behind his brother in the cornfield and slays him, the first murder dropped like a little pebble in that cup that Jesus held that day. When the Lindbergh baby was taken out of that room, that heinous man took his fingers and put them to the, to the throat of that boy and threw the life out of that little helpless innocent child. That murder dropped like a drag in the cup he held that day. The cup that Jesus held was a cup in which every sin from the ages had been cast. And the argument of Jesus was an argument, I think, like this. He was saying, Father, if it be possible, per se, I've lived a perfect life. I've never sinned. I've never sinned. Won't a perfect life suffice for sin? And God argues, no, son, only the death of a perfect one. But Father, Father, I had a perfect ministry. Why well, don't know of another preacher that would have withstood what I withstood. And yet, I never equivocated. I never pulled down my standard. I never dipped my seal. Won't a perfect ministry suffice? And God argues, no, only the death of a perfect minister, and on and on. After an hour, he was worn out. After all, it was God in the flesh, and the flesh was taking the testing. And he was worn out, and, and he sobs in his prayer, and finally he says, I, I need encouragement. Oh, my inner circle. I can depend on them. I, I'll just go back, and I'll be encouraged by them. And he goes back and he finds the inner circle, Peter, James, and John, exactly as he would find the local church today if he came home. Sound asleep. Sound asleep, just folding their hands and nodding their heads. Peter! James! John! Could you not watch with me one hour? Is it asking too much to stand by me when I need you? And I see my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ stagger back and throw himself down in the sockets of the earth. And he prayed until his sweat turned crimson. But thank God, he won that battle. As he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done.
Jesus said, the one upon whom I plant the kiss. He is the one. Come on. We bargained for it. 30 pieces. Put it there. All right, it is good. And he walked in to the clearing. And as the manner of Jewish men in that day, he took the hand of Jesus and pressed the back of it to his lips and kissed it and said, All hail, chief! And they came, the soldiers, and they pinned his arms to his side and they bound him. And they walked him down the Kidron Valley, past Absalom's tomb into the Dung Gate, and up the Via Della Rosa, the Way of Sorrows, to the third station. There he stands in the court of Caiaphas. And they take from him his seamless garment and place upon him the scarlet robe of mockery and of shame. And they untie him and place a wilted reed in his hand. And they blindfold him. And as he's blindfolded, a soldier walks up to him and smites him. Prophesy who hath smitten thee, Lord. Come, thou art omniscient. What's my name? And as Isaiah prophesied as a lamb before his shears, he was dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He just stood there, and he took it, and he took it. And then with an oath, the soldier puts his knee upon the chest of Jesus, his hand on his forehead, and entwines his fingers in the hair of his face, and rips it out and spits in its place. And Jesus stands there. And he says not a mumbling word. He just takes it, and he takes it. Then a soldier comes with the reed in his hand. I wish I had never looked that up in Greek class. It's haunted me ever since. I used to think a reed was a supple instrument like a quirt or a switch, but this word in the Greek means a stick, a hickory-type stick that doesn't give. And that soldier beats Jesus about the face and the head, the mouth and the neck, until Isaiah prophesied when they got through with him he wouldn't look like a human being. And he stands there and he takes it, and he takes it, and he takes it. Then a cruel soldier plaits a crown of thorns, long, piercing, jabbing thorns, and slips up behind Jesus and brings it down in his brow and the blood spurts and mingles with the spittle on his face as his, as his bandana about his eyes shade down to his neck. And then they take the cat of nine tails, and again, I wish I hadn't looked this up, but what they did with the cat of nine tails, they embedded at a 45 degree angle to the stress of the leather, little slits in the leather, and in those little slits, they place small pieces of stone, sharp-edged, or metal, and they would take horsehair and sew them in so that a man that knew his business could take the cat and nine tail and as he twisted it and laid it on the malefactor's back, those straps would lay side by side and when he brought it back, he could take off the skin just like a surgeon's knife, the width of two hands, and they brought it down on the back of Jesus. And Jesus took it and 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 took it. And I could see him on one knee, suddenly a tear trickling down his cheek. And I hear a soldier say, ah, he's a tough one. We haven't had the likes of him around here. But I knew we'd get through to him. No, 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 no. History recorded correctly. Tell why he weeps. Why his eyes are fastened on an old friend that stands at a fireside just 13 feet away. I measured it. He stands there warming himself. And a soldier comes by and says, aren't you one of his disciples? No, I never saw the guy before in my life. I just came in to get some food. What did you do, rob a bank? Boy, you're really giving it to him. Another comes by and said, you're the one that took out the sword and cut the son of the high priest. Here off. No, don't you equate me with his crime. I never knew him. A little Hebrew girl, just a maiden, 12 or 13, walks up with a water pot on her head and looks at him and says, Sir, thy speech betrayeth thee. When people walk with Jesus, their language cleans up. You notice that? Thy speech 
betray thee. You don't swear like the others. And Peter, that he might not feel the pain of his Lord, curled his lip and spat out an oath and said, Now do you believe me? I don't know him. And Jesus winced, and the tears flowed unbidden down his cheek as the crow, as the crow crowed twice, the cock crowed twice. And Peter turns in his shame and leaves Jesus alone. The next morning, they take Christ as back as scab. He's been chained in the prison all night, and I stood there also. It, could, you, uh, it came right about to my chin. If Christ were the age or, or the, the size of most of the men of his day, he had to all night be stooped like this with his hands above his head, and he could not relax. He had to stand. Here he comes, his bones are stretched, ready for the crucifixion. His back is scabbed, ready to be opened to bleed. And they bring him before Pilate. His hands are tied in front of him. His face is puffed. His eyes are almost closed. What's left of him stands before Pilate. And Pilate says, Jesus, thou sayest that thou art a king? Thou sayest to Pilate, yes, I'm a king. <laughs> Jesus. Kings have subjects. Look about you, Jesus. These are my subjects. Tell me, Jesus, where are your subjects? Watch him, watch him. James! My father knew. Mark! Luke! Go on. Call them all off, Jesus. They're not there. The Bible said... When the shepherd was smitten, the sheep scattered. They're not there. The Bible said they all, in one accord, cried, crucify him. There was not a descending boat. And they scourge his back with a whip. They open up those wounds. And then they place on that bleeding back the stem of the cross. There's two parts to the cross, the Roman cross. One is the lateral, one is the stem. Stem weighs about 100 pounds. The lateral weighs about 65 pounds. The lateral usually is carried by another man. We know him to be Simon of Cyrene, who ended up carrying both pieces. The stem was laid upon the back of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Cursed is he that hangeth upon a tree. And it was the custom of the Jews of that day, when one was to be crucified, to stand in their little places of business and alongside the Via Della Rosa at their house openings with stones and with, with any kind of a switch or wires, little kids were let out of school so they could come and get rotten tomatoes and eggs, and they'd stand there, and as the malefactor who was to be cursed because he was to be on a tree, as he walked by, they would spit upon him and throw garbage upon him and abuse him. No wonder, no wonder when he came to Golgotha, he couldn't make it up that last part. His flesh gave way, and Simon of Cyrene had to help him up to the top. Then they lay the cross down and they take the leather and they twine the lateral upon the stem. And the soldier lays Jesus out with his back upon that cross. He reaches in and he finds the sinewy in the middle of the hand. Your hand has an M in it. As the two lines meet, the first part of the M, you come down three quarters of an inch. There's gristle there. There's four muscles and three bones that come across there. And if you get a knife or rather you get a nail in there with any kind of a head to it, you can't pull it through those bones. And the one who put a malefactor on the cross had to put him on to stay because the law of the Roman was if he could get off by any way. The one who nailed him there would die in his place. So they were careful. And he fell to the hand. And he found that sinewy. And he takes the hammer. And he brings it down upon the hand of Jesus. <coughs> and it slithers through his flesh. And it fixes itself to the beam. And his other hand is placed with this one. And it too becomes part of the wood. And then his feet. Note, please, please note. The left foot first, 45 degree angle, the knee. Left foot pulled up. The right foot put over it. Nail goes in right here between the big toe and the first toe. Through the ball of the foot. In to the top of the foot, the second foot, through the heel into the wood, thus fulfilling the prophecy that 
its head shall bruise thy heel. And they nail him to the cross, and then five or six heavy men pick it up and carry it over to the post, and they drop it, and his body reaches. And they sit down and pull out their little picnic lunches. They gamble over his robe, and they talk about politics. The Bible says, in sitting down, they watched him there. The poison begins to seep into the body of Jesus. It begins to take its toll. The temperature is going up by the hour. 99, 100, 101 degrees. I thirst. Water, please. And the cruel soldier takes a spear and gouges a sponge and puts it in vinegar and gall and places it to his lips. <coughs> they won't give me water. They're all gone. They're all gone. Mother's here. John's here. But everybody else is gone. No one cares. Wait. Wait, there's one that cares. There's one who cares. It's, it's my father's will that I'm here. I, I know what I'll do. I'll just steal a little glimpse into heaven. I'll just view my father's face. And the smile of encouragement upon his face will suffice me in my hour. And I see Jesus as he gazes across the eon of space. And suddenly his tears blush upon his eyes. And his chin falls upon his chest as he sees not his father God. He sees the back of his father God. For God, who is holy and cannot look on sin, turned his back on his only begotten son, who became sin for us that day, shrouded this earth in the darkest noonday she's ever known before or since. Oh, Oh, now hear it. Maybe it will mean something to you. Eli, Eli, long by Sabbath's the night. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why, Jesus, Isaiah tells us, he was a man acquainted with grief and sorrows. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was stricken and smitten. And we esteemed him not. Jesus, you have to die on that felon's cross exactly as you lived on this earth. Alone, forgotten, forsaken. The lonely Jesus. Of Calvary's mountain, one dreadful day, walked Christ my Savior, wounded and worn, praying for sinners while in such woe, no one but Jesus. What are you talking about? Haven't you heard he's dead? It's all over. We made a mistake. We had our mind on an earthly kingdom. Can't win them all. I'm going back to the Sea of Galilee. After all, I'm a fisherman. 
I'll have to make a life for myself now. You too, Luke? Hi. I'll have to take a refresher's course and get my hands back steady again, but I'm a doctor. I can help somebody, you know. Yes, I go back to my shingle. And Matthew? Hi, I'm a tax collector. That work I know. We thought he would live forever, but he's dead, and let's face it, it's all over. They all go back to their own haunts. I don't see the Bible telling me that any of them were there to see him rise. There was no one sitting on the hills that first sunrise service. No, there were two that came down, the two Marys. They had in their hands spiking out of ointment and myrrh. They came down to anoint a dead body, to prolong it a little longer on this earth. And as they came into the garden, they, they said, Look, the stone's been rolled away in his... His windings are there, but he's gone. There's one sitting on the stone. It's possibly the gardener. She runs and says, Pray tell, sir, where have they laid my Lord? We, we want to anoint his body with myrrh and frankincense. And a voice falls upon their lips or their ears that undoubtedly sounded like the trickling of many waters. Mary, Rabboni, touch me not, for I have not as yet ascended to my father. But go tell my disciples and tell Peter, I'm going on a 40-day mission. I'm going to gather some people. Meet me in the upper room. And Jesus goes on the Emmaus Road and meets two. Goes down here and meets six. Meets a few more over here. Meets many here until he gathers 120. 120 that will stand with him as he stands upon the Mount of Olives. And he looks out upon that crowd the last time he was on this earth, and he gives his last instructions. He says, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore into all nations, and make me... Go on, Jesus. Don't leave without telling us. Make you what? Make me friends. That's what the word disciples means. Make me friends. I'm tired of standing in a stained glass. I'm tired of occupying the front page of a bulletin. Go out and tell congregations all over the world that I want friends. Friends that will be with me in bad times as well as good. Not fair weather friends, foul weather friends, prayer meeting friends, visitation friends, soul winning friends, persecuted friends, dying friends. I want friends. I want friends. I'm here to tell you tonight that my Lord has suffered enough without him. He needs friends. Except ye forsake all, ye cannot be his friend. For the word disciple means friends. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes all over the house, please? Heads bowed and eyes closed.